What I've come away with from this, a couple of things. I teach high-rise fi uh, firefighting in the state of Illinois. And I, I work with Keith Wood a lot, another battalion chief from the city of Chicago. And we've come to the point where we're saying, look, you're in a high-rise building, you ventilate nothing under any conditions ever until you have water on the fire. That's how significant this potential is, right? Because you don't know what the wind conditions are necessarily, right? The wind conditions can change. We want water on the fire before you begin the ventilation process. That's where we've gotten to. And I'm coming very close to saying all first water on a high-rise building fire needs to be from the exterior. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm pretty darn close to it, right? Because you can see how dramatically the condition, everything's going fine until that window changes. Everything's going fine until the wind shifts, and then it becomes impossible, right? I don't have the manpower. I don't have the resources. You got the manpower to send another crew down that hallway? No, right? Take the time, control the doors, control the corridors, let the building do its job, right? and rethink how we want to approach these fires. That's what I'm taking away from it. It's very counterintuitive, right? Lock the ventilation opening, start first water from the outside. You know, if you were to go to somebody just off the cuff and say, we're gonna start an aggressive interior fire attack by applying water from the outside first, you get that two heads look, right? But you can see here, it's a viable tactic, right? When the conditions call for it, right? And that's why I love this stuff, getting the science, to the street, because if you tried to argue these concepts without the science that these guys provide to us, nobody would give you that time of day. When you can show them this, when you can show them the data, it's repeatable, it happens over and over and over again. I can make this happen anytime I want to, and I got the actual fires now to back it up. Now they have to start listening, right? Now we can make some changes. Now we can start bringing those numbers down, right? Maybe, with this kind of information and getting it where it needs to be. And that's why I've been so excited to be involved in this project and uh, to come here and to spread the word, get it out, do whatever we can to get it out. Gary? What the Chicago Fire Department enjoys is the experience and credibility of Chief Van Dorp and Chief Witt, who we just spoke about, offering their experience to a department to say these are things we have to change. FDNY tough and nut, hard shell, used to uh, fighting fires one way for a long, long time. For us, and this whole project, was bridging the gap between science and the art of firefighting. After the, the Vandalia event, our department took, uh, let's say, revisited our firefighting procedures and they implemented some changes, and one of the changes was do not vent the bulkhead. And I can tell you, to, the, to this day, there's still firefighters opening the bulkhead at these fires. To say we have 11,500 firefighters, that's 11,500 opinions on how fires react and how fires have behaved when these firefighters were on the fire ground. The challenge is to one, train, share, and the message to be delivered by credible people. And also, have the influence of staff. It really took that. It was so many years ago, back in the 70s, that our chief of the department, a gentleman by the name of John O'Hagan, performed a study on stairwell pressurization of fixed systems. Unique individual in that he was the chief of our department and the commissioner at the same time, and he proved that fans could pressurize stairwells and keep them smoke free. They offered it into the building codes, but they offered trade-offs, so really only a handful of buildings in New York City, and I'm sure throughout the United States, have stairwell pressurization. And it was after these events to say, and not just the injuries of firefighters, firefighters going to the hospitals, the fatalities, it was the many injuries and fatalities of civilians on upper floors, remote from the fire, being overcome by smoke in stairwells and hallways. To say, when we looked at changes in our firefighting procedures after Vandalia, okay, closing the bulkhead door was just one thing. Finding an area of refuge on the same side as the fire apartment because of pressures. I said, what else 
are we doing? What else are we doing? We're still meeting this fire head on. What are we doing about smoke control? We were doing nothing. The fire service was doing nothing. And if fixed systems of fans could do something to control smoke and stairwells, why couldn't portable fans do the same thing? But what size? That research in Toledo, we went through the configurations, fans small and large, and we came up with the pressures needed to control smoke. The information that we've, let's say, uncovered, in our face, you've seen the videos, fire in the hallway, fire in the stairwells. All the firefighters that we brought out to Governor's Island, we just didn't hire anybody. Do I have volunteers that want to go to Governor's Island for a few live burns? Uh, no, we made sure that every firefighter that was hand-picked to join that project was firefighters that had credibility in the field. Not every one of them were coming to Governor's Island to say, hey, yeah, whatever you want to do, well, we'll go out there. No, they came with skepticism, and that was okay because we knew at the end of that project we made believers out of every one of them. Not only those firefighters that were going to go back into the field and become emissaries of the message. Firefighters that could stand in front of a room of other skeptics for them to say, boy, if they're saying it, I believe it. And the staff chiefs came out and they witnessed what we were doing. First hand, that fire you saw, puffing smoke with natural wind, was to say, oh my God, this could happen this afternoon. We need to make change. And it was only with the credibility of scientists, science, engineers, that taught us more about fire behavior, built the laboratories so that we could film it and prove our case. And we're sharing that information with you. Wind-driven fires are not just in high-rise multiple dwellings. To say, with every action, there's a reaction. Did a scientist say that or a fireman? To say, when we step off that truck in front of that building, every action has a reaction. We open up the door to the lobby. It's a private dwelling. We open up the door to enter. That could be the very first vent that this building is receiving. If it's a fire in a bedroom on the second floor of a two and a half story peak private dwelling and it's winter time and it's five degrees out, when we open the front door of that dwelling, where's the draft? Where's that high pressure gonna travel? Right down the stairs, right to that front door. To say every action is a reaction for firefighters to understand everything that we do, long before boarding the fire truck, we had to learn something and we have to have disciplines. Those disciplines are our size up, being prepared, understanding what we're looking for when we perform our size up. What do we want to see? How do we want to coordinate ourselves? Do we want to vent the roof? Are we going to coordinate all of that work? When we reach the fire floor and we're met with these extreme conditions, do we have options? Do we have other tools? Yes, we do. And I would say, we're not going to call it the floor below nozzle. We're going to call it the high-rise nozzle. Do you think that, yes, that team right there, would you bring the floor below nozzle over here and fight this fire from the floor below? <laughs> no. We're going to call it the high-rise nozzle because it's a tool. Wherever you can set it up, in many cases, it's going to be the floor below. Where you can introduce water and change the conditions so that we can then mount the attack and hit this head on. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to get home safe. And now, even this generation of firefighters right here, you're going to have to pass it on to the next generation. And we're going to keep on learning. And this gap between science and the art, it's going to continue. And there's so many more things that we're going to learn. And I'm so proud to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. That wraps up our presentation for this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the people that, some of the people, in any event, that were uh, critically important to making this project a success. We mentioned many of them. Uh, Skip Coleman and the Toledo Fire Department kind of got it off the ground. Uh, New York City Fire Department and the upper echelons of the Chicago Fire Department were fantastic. 
There's some people that couldn't be here tonight. Pete McBride from the Ottawa Fire Department, he's a chief up there. He was with us during most of the project, great contributor to it. And the people you see on the screen, Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Fire Administration, National Fire Data Center, the Media Production Center, the National Fire Academy are making this all possible. Because as we've said over and over again, it's not just getting the work done, it's getting the work out onto the street where it can be put to work by the firefighters on the back step, as we used to say. Thankfully, they're not there anymore. But without all of these people, we couldn't make that happen. So thanks again for your time and attention. And we'll be hanging around to talk. Thank you.